<laughs> Welcome to Speak for Yourself, delivered by Pizza Hut. <sighs> Order today at PizzaHut.com. I'm Marcel Swally. He's a man. He's out of breath. He's sweating. He's out of breath. Struggling. He has a sprint to set. Yes, you Because did. he locked himself out of his dressing room. Twice. Twice. My man. Welcome back. <laughs> All right, let's get it started right here in L.A., where the Lakers have made a complete overhaul in their roster so far this offseason. And to put it mildly, the new additions bring a lot of experience. Lakers have the average age, 31 years old now, which is the highest in the NBA. And don't forget, LeBron James is 36 years old. Not getting any younger. So I choke. Will the Lakers age catch up with them? Uh, so I'm, first off, it's good to be back. It is. Even when I don't see you for a day, I miss you, my dog. Don't lie. I miss real talk, man. We got so much just uh, affection for one another. So I miss you, bro. I miss you. I feel you. Uh, I don't miss ignorant questions from you. Oh. I don't miss those, but I miss you. We're here already. <laughs> <laughs> Have we arrived already at ignorance? <laughs> um, will the Lakers age cap- catch up to them? It will and it won't. So for mm. something to catch up to you, that thing would have had to have granted you some sort of advantage. Huh? You can't catch up to somebody if you're behind. Mm. And you can't catch up to somebody if you're equal. So how can something that grants you no advantage Wait, be caught up to? What are you trying Pause to tell for me right a second. here? Okay. Pause for a second. All right. If you and I what? are racing... I'm in front. And you in front. No, I am in front. Facts. It's a little time. Then I can catch up to you. Okay, okay. But if you and I are racing and we're either neck and neck right. or you are behind me, thus you have no advantage, oh, so I, I can't can catch up to you. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. I feel that. The Lakers' age is not going to give them a competitive advantage. Mm. So if the Lakers' age is not going to give them a competitive advantage, <laughs> then their age cannot catch up to them because their age has not granted them an advantage. Mm. Because the Lakers were injured last year, because the Warriors have been injured, a lot of Western Conference teams that typically have no place in dominance in the West yeah. have been dominant. Mm. So when we all think of, well, the Lakers got Melo, they got LeBron, they got Dwight, they got seasoned vets. Sure, okay. they do. Mm. But seasoned as it pertains to what? Melo ain't been to an NBA Finals. Are we doing Westbrook it? has only been to one NBA Finals. Dwight has been to two NBA Finals. But y'all think about it for a second. The Utah Jazz were one seed last year. The last two times in the playoffs, they have significant playoff experience. The Denver Nuggets went to the Western Conference Finals two years ago this past year. Obviously, again, to the playoffs. Significant playoff experience. The okay. Phoenix Suns. The lowly Phoenix Suns. Well, surely oh, they ain't been to the Finals in all CP3. They went to the finals just last year. That's right. So the Lakers' age, typically in our minds, should grant them some sort of playing, playoff experience. Mm. But in all honesty, the Lakers' age is giving them no advantage. Thus, I don't think their age can catch up to them because it's not as though their age is what's put them ahead Uh, or their age is actually uh. doing anything notable. Okay. Look, welcome back. My dog. God, I needed somebody to beat up on, and you are here. <laughs> you beat up on Slick yesterday, I thought. No. Well, Greg beat up on me on the Raiders. Good Lord. So, you know, we're even. Um, man, age ain't nothing but a number. Talk about it. Talk about it. Uh, the of the fray. Do you know that song, at least? I, I know, I know, yes. Okay, respect. Okay. I'm not going to say age ain't nothing but a number because the older I got, the worse I got. Like, you know, <laughs> it gets to a point where you're like, all right, uh, these are diminishing returns in terms of this age. I give you that, Acho, but you are wrong about the Lakers. Age is not going to catch up with them in terms of undermining them. You hate equity. Here's another E you hate. You don't hate Emmanuel for some reason, <laughs> but you hate experience. You hate it on Tom Brady almost the entire year, mostly because he was too experienced. Now you're hating on the Lakers almost because they have too, too much experience. Here's the problem that you're running into. You don't understand what LeBron is seeing in terms of landscape out there as opponents, contenders out there, and then looking at his squad and realizing, I couldn't trust a Kyle Kuzma. Kyle Kuzma didn't trust in our system, so Mm -hmm. I couldn't trust in him. He would go awry too often. So LeBron James has come to a realization, I need to have a veteran-laden team of guys that I know I can put in specific roles, activate when necessary, and not burn too much tread off the tires, right? So that's the mindset. Now let's talk about how this is going to work for the Lakers. Did a lot of research here. Did too much research, actually. I got all these other sports here. I don't even want to talk about them old players in other sports. Let's talk about the Lakers. How old are the Lakers in average age? 33? 31, 31. they say. 31, average age. The Lakers' engine is not 31 years old. It's 28 years old. It's by the name of Anthony Davis. Okay. So if your driving force is young in his prime, what is really the issue? It's not age. It's health. 
Think about the Lakers with LeBron James. LeBron James has no AD, no young engine. They don't go to the playoffs. Mm -hmm. He gets hurt. He gets that young engine. He gets AD. Uh-oh. We win a championship. All of a sudden, the next year, we're 21-7. and seven. That young engine conks out again. Check engine light on. He goes down. We become a sub-500 team. The driving force for the Lakers is actually young. It's a 28-year-old in his prime engine by the name of Anthony Davis. Now, let's take it to the experience why it will add up for the Lakers. Lakers are 31 years old in average age. Let's look at teams that have won the NBA championship at that same age or older. Oh, were you saying this, Acho, in 2003 when the Spurs won it? Mm, they were 31 and a half years old. Were you saying it in 2011 when your Dallas Mavericks won it? They were older. What about the Spurs in 20, 2007 when they beat the LeBron James Cavaliers team? You saying it then? Chicago Bulls. Oh, nobody dares say Michael's too old. Well, he did it once, twice, three times. Remember that? Back to back to back, 96, 97, 98. And what about the 2013 Miami Heat team? Old as this team. No one was complaining then. So why are you complaining yeah. now? I got the driving force is in this prime. You, get, you gave me a lot to chew on, big dog, and oh, I'm glad because I'm hungry. I came to the show hungry, y'all. Oh, I need to chew <laughs> on some things. That's That's um, I'm not hating the Lakers' age. That's not what it is. I'm just expressing that their age gives them no competitive advantage. I have no problem with their age. I have no problem with their experience. You don't think I'm just, so? I gave you all these championship teams that are old. No, but here's why, here's why I'll give you that. <clears throat> Because like you, you made me jump a point, but I'm fine. I'll get to that okay. point. Okay. Um, the championship teams you gave me that are old, their nucleus was still young. Now, AD might be young, but let's go to those 03 Spurs. Tim Duncan got to the league in, what was it, 97, 98? So in 03, Tim Duncan would have only been roughly 27. Remember, Tony Parker gets to the league after Tim Duncan and Manu after that. So the nucleus of the Spurs, their three best players, would have still been young. Mm -hmm. Miami Heat, 2013. If LeBron is 35 now, 2013, LeBron would have been, what, 27? Mm -hmm. D. Wade would have been right there around 27, mm -hmm. 28. Mm -hmm. The nucleus of that team, Chris Bosh, roughly the same age, is still young. Yeah. So when you talk about this Lakers team, however, I don't know if the nucleus, now you got to add at least Russell Westbrook into the nucleus. 33. Russell Westbrook, LeBron, AD. 36. That average age is still then 31, 32. I so the that. nucleus of that team is older. But here's a point I have to sit on for a second if we can put the car in part. You said that the Lakers issues are not health are not age-related, they are health-related. Yeah. I agree with you. Lakers issues yeah. aren't age-related, they're health-related. Yeah. But in life, there's a direct correlation between age and health. Really? And the older we really? get, the more health begins to... Tell that to, to a young person that just died. Okay, what? but what about the older people? <laughs> well, they're going to die, too. <laughs> okay, what, what do I say? You, you know you're this, you've grown. There comes a, a point in your life when, you, when you're 40, you got to start to go to your checkups. When you're 50, you got to make sure you do this. They don't tell you to do it at 20. Yeah, now, it's not to say you cannot falter or you cannot succumb to certain diseases yeah. at 20, at 10, at 15, unfortunately. Yeah in this life that we live. But they do say, when you hit 40, amen, it's when you got to go get that colon checked. <laughs> you know, when you hit 50, that's when you got to go do, because there's a direct correlation between age and the lack of health or between age and health starting to uh, go down the hill. So while the Lakers issue might not be age, it might be health. Remember, that age bucket is pouring into that health bucket, mm. which pours right back into the Lakers issues. No lies. No lies told. Um, there is a direct correlation. You even go causation. I give you that. It also could be a coincidence that so many veteran latent teams win championships. Think about how the Lakers really won the championship a, a couple years ago. It was because of the group, the nucleus, the, LeBron James, Telling this team, when we go into the bubble, let's stay focused. That's real. Let's get into this bubble and grind it all the way through. Younger teams, younger mindsets, teams that were just like, okay, this is good to be here, struggle through that, mm -hmm. right? It's a focus issue. Now, through all the changes that have occurred from pandemic, in the pandemic, out the pandemic, mass bubble, compromise season, 72, 82, we all know what's going on, short and off season. You need someone to steer the ship in the proper direction. That's still LeBron James. Um, I gave you three examples of the Chicago Bulls where their driving force, obviously, is Michael Jordan, who was 32, 33, 34 years old. Mm -hmm. Younger than LeBron, but still older. But as a collective team, they relied on old individuals, older than the Lakers are right now, to get them over the hump. I have another list of teams that just appear in the finals. They lose, but still older teams. 
the thing about the Lakers that's beautiful is their older players, think about it, are all great at their age. Carmelo Anthony, people are trying to slight him a little bit because he's going to Lakers. How's that going to work because of age? Carmelo Anthony is a great catch-and-shoot shooter. Yes. Carmelo Anthony shot 41% from the three-point line last year. Carmelo Anthony is appreciative of his second-chance experience in the NBA. Guess what? That's what you need. LeBron James controls pace. No one is slower on the court than LeBron James on purpose, but then also activates when necessary. LeBron James is a genius on the court. Russell Westbrook, you wouldn't know he was 33 years old until someone showed you his birth certificate because he is the Energizer Bunny. He keeps going, has never fatigued Mr. Carbohydrate. Point being, we can keep talking about the older players here. Other than Mark Gasol, <laughs> Dwight Howard's 35. Did you watch Dwight Howard in Philadelphia last year? That's not 35. Good. So all of this is just birth certificate. All of this is just old adage. But then when you look into the details, you start to realize this is all going to be a plus for them. I, I want to jump on that boat with you. So I do because obviously I'm a Lakers fan and you know I'm going to pick <laughs> the I'm Lakers not. to win a chip regardless. <laughs> yeah. But I'm not too old, nor am I too young, to have forgotten We've seen this before from the Lakers. Oh, I'm not go. too old and don't I ain't go. too young don't go. Oh, to four. forgotten don't 2004. Go. I have to go there. Because 2004, the Lakers had an old 40-year-old Carl Malone. Second most points all time in NBA history. Future Hall of Famer. The Lakers had a 35-year-old Gary Payton. Probably the best on-ball guard defender in NBA history. The Lakers had them old cats. The Lakers had four future Hall of Famers. Shaq, Kobe, Malone, Payton. The Lakers right now have four future Hall of Famers. Westbrook, mm. LeBron, AD, Dwight. We've seen this before, Sal. Have we not? We've seen Have it. we not seen an old Lakers team? Now, it got to the finals, so let's make no mistake yeah, about it. And that they got hurt. still, to a degree, successful. Sure. And Malone, he did end up getting hurt. I believe he Thank ends up missing time you. in the finals. Thank you. But he got hurt because he was old. So it's almost making my point. I didn't want to call you on it, but you almost just made my point. He got hurt because <laughs> he was old. So, Sal, I remember this 04 Lakers team when they had four future Hall of Famers, and we wrote them into a championship. They got to the finals. Yeah. I think this Lakers team will be fine, but I also think that if we want to say that it caught up to him, sure, we can say yeah. that. I just don't think it'll give him a competitive advantage. Look, I'm with you. It's a similar story to 2004. You're right. Uh, it, it seems like the names are driving a lot of the moves, right? But then when you look into these moves, I don't even... This is not a 40-year-old uh, 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 Carl Malone you're seeing right here. You're seeing 33-year-old Russell Westbrook, who was most efficient off-ball in Houston. His most efficient year was when he was off-ball. Guess what he's going to be with the Lakers? Off ball. I just see this working too well together. I'm also going to agree with you here. If this doesn't work out, it's going to be because of age, which is going to contribute to the health demise. Mm -hmm. So all of that said, it seems like the Lakers are in prime position. This was a play-in team last year. They won't be in no play-in situation <laughs> this year. We'll see how high the ceiling really is. Coming up, there have been a lot of highlights in the Olympics so far. We'll tell you which moments have impressed us the most. But first, the Cowboys are taking a conservative approach with Dak Prescott. That's right. We'll tell you if that makes us concerned. And that's next on Speak for Yourself. Tomorrow on Fox, the NFL is back. Let's go, baby. <laughs> As the Steelers battle the Cowboys in the Hall of Fame game. All the action is on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Well, speaking of that game, speaking of the Cowboys, Dak Prescott, he won't be playing, and he's still on the mend after straining his right shoulder last week. He said recently that he knows he'll be fine and is not worried about the injury causing problems. Head coach Mike McCarthy gave an update on his quarterback status. Y'all take a look. After the research and, and, and looking at it, we just don't want this to turn into something something big. So it's um, he's doing everything that he possibly can, and uh, but we're just we're just being a little more conservative with rehab. If it's in season, I think it would be a different outlook, you know, different focus. But this, you know, because of where we are, having the extra week, uh, we just want to make sure this doesn't turn into something bigger. So Marcellus Vernon, <laughs> you sound like that. Wiley, you sound like that dude. <laughs> <laughs> you concerned about Dak Prescott? How concerned are you about Dak? Prescott? I'm not concerned about Dak Prescott mm. at all. Come on, man, let's take the suits off, put on our equipment again. We know how it goes. It's preseason. Context matters. Let's take you back 
First of all, take the suit off, got your equipment on, you got your different mindset. I have more muscles, too, y'all. Don't get it Did twisted. You? Back in the day, your boy was swole. <laughs> back now. in the day, what, back in yesterday? You still swole, <laughs> fool. So here we go. Autos change, right? <laughs> we're back where we're supposed to be, where it all started. It's the preseason. Context matters, correct? And now let's take you to the Dallas Cowboys organization facilities when Dak Prescott got hurt last year. Take you there in mindset because I want you to feel right now in this moment, the PTSD that everyone's feeling if Dak is hurt again. We all know that when something is small, if you don't address it, it will snowball. And then all of a sudden, compensation will occur. Now, you're talking about a lat strain, and you're like, well, that doesn't sound too complex, doesn't sound too much, until it turns into the shoulder. Mm -hmm. And then that turns into the throwing motion. Talk about it. And then next thing you know, you're snowballing downhill trying to stop something that is avalanche that could have been avoided. It's called the preseason for a reason. Let's not make smart decisions look dumb. And a lot of people like to do that. Because when you say something smart, if you say it too ahead of everyone else's intelligence, they think you the dummy. Or they try to make you the dummy. I've been there a few times. I'm in my there life. right <laughs> now. Hey, don't be too far ahead of the pack. Because they're going to be looking at you like, come back. That's how it goes. Anyway, we've been here before, Acho. Let's not act like this is a moment of concern. This is a moment that they've been through before in extreme, and they don't want it to get anywhere close to that place again. So I'm not concerned about Dak Prescott for them being cautious. Man, Sal, I can't even be mad at anything you say for the next five minutes <laughs> because you was preaching right there, okay. big dog. You said you say things too far ahead of the pack, they'll make you the dummy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I ain't lived that out the last two weeks. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> I'm concerned, though. No. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Oh, when you pack. look at people get when you look at people get injured, the question is not what did they injure? The question is more so how did they get injured or why mm -hmm. did mm -hmm. they get injured? Oh, My biggest question is always the why, right? When Carson Wentz got injured, I freaked out a little bit. But then I saw, wait a second, Quentin Nelson got injured and Quentin Nelson has been through three all pro, made three all pro teams his first three years in the league. Jeez. And they got the same injury. Jeez. So I'm no longer questioning Carson Wentz's toughness or his ability to stay healthy because one of the toughest, if not the toughest person in football, beast, mm -hmm. Quentin Nelson, they got the same injury. Yeah. So now I'm questioning the cleats and I'm questioning the football field. I'm not questioning Carson Wentz. Right. You got to wonder why did people get injured? Okay. So Dak, I'm asking myself, why did he get injured? People are like, oh, it's just a shoulder, big dog. It ain't got nothing to do with his ankle. Don't even trip. It ain't got nothing to do with his ankle. But does it? See, if you just look through the peephole, it has nothing to do with his mm -hmm. ankle. But if you open up the door, you start to see it has a little more to do with his ankle. Why did he strain his shoulder? Probably because his shoulder is not in the same condition it typically is. Why is his shoulder not in the same condition it typically is? Probably because he did not throw as much this offseason. Why did he not throw as much this offseason? Probably because of his ankle. Okay. It always goes back to that. Uh -huh. Kevin Durant, why did he <laughs> tear his Achilles? Well, he tore his Achilles because he tore his Achilles. Acho, duh. No. He tore his Achilles because he had a strained calf. Klay Thompson, why did he tear his Achilles? Well, he tore his Achilles. Acho, because he tore his Achilles. He was hooping, open gym. Duh. No, because he was recovering from a torn ACL. Kinetic chain. You've mm -hmm. talked about it at length. Yes, yes. So, Dak Prescott, it is a concern because the concern is the why. If he just has a sore shoulder, but he had been healthy all of last season, all through training camp, ah, I'm not concerned. I ain't tripping at all. Got a sore shoulder, it happens. More than anything, probably just precautionary. But so he has a sore shoulder because, as Dak said, after the shoulder was immediately hurt, you know, just trying to get back in shape. But what will it cost them? My second lap, I'm going to talk about why I'm concerned even that they're holding him out. Wow. Okay, didn't expect this. It's okay. Wait, wait, <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> hey, where are you from, homie? So, okay, let's talk about where we are now because I love you taking us to this layer uh, of why it occurred. You didn't... Factor in one other reason why it could have occur uh, occurred. Mm -hmm. Overexertion. Think okay. about this. You actually, I don't know your rep count, more than likely less than normal off seasons because mm -hmm. you're focusing in on healing the ankle, et cetera. But maybe you're trying too much, too fast, or you're just in total volume doing too much because I want to make sure that I'm good up here because I know I'm good down here. I've been in this position before. It really takes me to my point of why I'm not concerned is because now it's about protocol. It's about how we protect you in this process of getting you fully healthy. Because as you said in the kinetic chain, things are not linear. Things are not even. Your ankles, when you break a bone, they say when it heals, it heals stronger mm -hmm. than the other bone that wasn't broken. Mm -hmm. I tore my Achilles. 
So now I have some artificial mesh or whatever it may be in there. They tell me my torn Achilles is stronger than my natural Achilles. Wow. So the point is, Dak's mind is not on his ankle anymore. It's just surgically repaired. But now it's on my shoulder, and maybe I'm doing too much. So the team jumps in and says, wait a minute, you are doing too much. You had a lat strain. You missed four days of practice. That turned into a sore shoulder. Now, soreness is your body's way of whispering. Like, hey, I yo, what you doing? What you doing? <laughs> slow down. And so they said, slow down. If you're listening to your body because your trainers are listening to your body, why is this a reason for concern? Mm -hmm. Everyone's on the same page in terms of that. My story is this. When I broke my foot in San Diego, week one, had the surgery, came back. They said, Marcellus, you had a surgery. You're back. We understand that you're compromised right now, but we want you to play. You want to play. You can play. But the procedure, the protocol can't be for you to practice the same and still play. You only have so much tread on those tires. So we're going to preserve you for when it matters most. That's what they're doing. Preserving him from when it matters most. The regular season. In theory, it looks like that. But here's what I think they're doing, Cell. A little okay. bit, at least. Let me hear. They robbing Peter to pay Paul. Mm. But the problem when you rob Peter to pay Paul, somebody's so short on their bread. You feel me? Somebody's short well, money on their money. Because Paul was, or Peter was cool. But then they done robbed Peter. Paul cool. Yeah. But Peter like, where my bread at? And, and Paul better look out. Right, right. <laughs> look out. Right, right. Um, okay. What they're doing is, okay, we are going to preserve his shoulder. But you notice, know better than I know this, better than they know this, is the only way to get in football playing shape. Play football. It's by playing football. You got to play football. The only way to get in football playing yeah. shape is by playing football. So now what Cowboys are going to do is we're going to preserve Zach's shoulder. We're not going to play him in the preseason game. Well, keep in mind, he hasn't played in roughly 10 months. Going to preserve his shoulder, not play him in the preseason game. But now what if he's not in football playing shape? So mm. that defensive end, that Marcellus Wiley that just beat the offensive tackle on a quick slap rip move, Ooh. all of a sudden Dak would have escaped, mm. but he's not in playing shape. Yeah, yeah. So now Dak doesn't escape. Now Dak takes a hit that he wouldn't have taken had he been playing, thus been in playing shape. Mm. And now that hit that Dak would have avoided has now caused him to get injured again. Mm. All it is is robbing Peter to pay Paul but eventually somebody will always be short they bread. As I look at it, I'm still concerned because, sure, we'll protect his shoulder just like we protect his, his ankle, but now who's going to get robbed? Sure, Kevin Durant, his calf was intact, but what about his Achilles? Clay Thompson, his ACL was intact. Ah, but what about his Achilles? That's what we do in life. It's what we're doing on the football field. Mm. Oftentimes, we may <clears throat> preserve our financial health, but then we just robbed our emotional health. Okay, great. We preserved our financial health and our emotional health. We just robbed our spiritual health. Okay, we got our spiritual health and we got our emotional health. Ah, we just robbed our physical health. If you keep robbing cats, people still end up short chains. Mm. My fear is Dak will still end up short chains. Oh, man, you done took me to where Yoda lives. My man, the living Yoda in this world to me is Thomas Sowell. A lot of people love him, so a lot of people hate him. That's on y'all. I love him. And he always says, there are no solutions in life, just trade-offs. Hmm. And you just basically said the same thing. Okay, so now you're saying robbing Peter to pay Paul. Okay, that's fine. So now we're going to take care of the shoulder and we're going to rob your conditioning. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get you. But let me give you my example once again. That same season, I didn't practice one time. Not because I was sitting there chilling like I'm the man, just because, dog, I got to save it. I only got three hours worth of body experience on that football field a week. So I didn't practice. It did rob me, consequently. And next year, then you got another surgery. Now you got another issue. You got another thing because everything is off balance in that situation. But let's not exaggerate this. He has shoulder soreness. Ask every football player in the league, all 1,800 plus, do you have anything on you that's sore right now? <laughs> and if you raise your hand if you're sore. If so, no practice today. You would not see an NFL practice happen that year because everyone's sore. This is a guy who was just paid second most, second most uh, in payment in NFL history. This is a guy who's gotten hurt before, missed most of the season, almost all of it. This is a guy who they're highly sensitive, like maybe hypersensitive to anything that's going on with Dak Prescott because it affected everybody else, bro. Everybody else on that team looked worse when Dak Prescott was out. Ask C.D. Lamb. Ask Ezekiel Elliott. 
Ask all of them, Amari Cooper, et cetera. They all suffer without debt. So this is just a precaution. This is not something that you should be concerned for. But here's the thing, Sal, and you've told a story before. I might have to have you retell it. Uh -oh. It's not just about the outcome. It's about your character. Mm. And when I talk about Dak Prescott, it's not just about shoulder soreness. It's about the character. If, say, for example, Russell Wilson was held out with shoulder soreness, I wouldn't trip. Russell Wilson ain't missed a start in 144 games, played 144 consecutive games. I think that's currently the longest streak, or at least the second longest streak of the quarter at the quarterback okay. position. But Dak Prescott, you no longer have that grace of oh. immunity. Because mm. Dak, you've been hurt before. So if you were to uh, share a, a hotel room or a suite, a, a suite mate share room. Share a room. room. Okay. 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 I ain't Calm been this since my teens, brother. Okay. <laughs> You're in your dorm room. Oh, my roommate. Okay. You're in your dorm, dorm room. Okay. I, okay. First of all, I ain't have a roommate since freshman year. Bet. Your freshman uh, year. That's freshman it. Freshman year. Marcel's Wiley's at nobody. Columbia. And all of a sudden, his Jordans come up missing. His Jordans that he worked for come up missing. But his roommate, good kid, ain't nothing tripping. He, he, Marcel's Wiley's sweating. He's not sweating it. Uh, maybe I left him in the locker room. Maybe I left him in uh, the library. I don't know. Maybe I left him somewhere. But now, say your roommate oh. is a klepto. Maniac. I know one. All of a sudden, I'm a klepto. You going to ask <laughs> yeah, my own. the roommate. What happened to the shoes? The outcome was the same. You lost your shoes. Uh, but because of the character of the person I, you're sharing a suite I'm with, you. all of a sudden, uh -huh. you are questioning that yeah. outcome that was yeah. the exact same. Yeah. That's yeah. where I'm at with that. Yeah, yeah. If somebody else random has a shoulder sprain, somebody who had been healthy last year, healthy the entirety of his career, I'm not tripping at all. But because Dak now yeah. has a recent history of injuries, we got to question it. Carson Wentz. Mm. Only reason we question Carson Wentz, you, my friend, question Carson Wentz, because, I don't know, 18 months ago, he got a concussion and missed the game. Prior to that, he hadn't been hurt in the, the previous 12 months. You didn't watch him in college? <laughs> Stay there. But the reason, <laughs> exactly, it was in his character. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Quentin Nelson has the same yeah. exact Mm -hmm. Injury that is Carson Wentz. And ain't nobody tripping. We're all just like, oh, well, Quinn Nelson got yeah, hurt. That's yeah. unfortunate. Carson Wentz, he's hurt again. Yeah, yeah. Same exact injury. Dak Prescott, I'm wondering now, because now his character, his mm. physical character, mm. says he might be injury prone. Okay, I'm going to give you the story. I know what story you wanted for that, the character. It's funny, too. Uh, but points per game, let's talk about the character, the good side of the character. Uh, 11 more points a game with Dak Prescott. You better take care of that, man. 11 points? One player? Mm. Yardage per game goes up 177. You better take care of that. Third down percentage, yards per attempt, everything. This is just a better offense, better team with Dak Prescott. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. Here's the story. My grandma, her purse was misplaced. I don't even want to say stolen or lost. It's just misplaced. How come people don't ever say misplaced? They always say, who stole? Like, wait a minute. Misplaced. Grandma couldn't find a purse. Now, everybody looking around, where the purse at? Where the purse at? Now, everybody know my grandma carried a gun, too. So it was like, you better find this purse, because grandma will bust. And she did before, too. The other story. So anyway, so my uncle just got out jail. So everybody looking at him. Like, we looking around the house, but we looking like this. One eye looking for the house. <laughs> Woo! Finally, it just shows up. It just magically appears. And then everybody was like collectively let their breath out like, oh, it wasn't him. Why did we go there in the first place? To your point, his character. But he was a good guy. <laughs> All right, coming up, the king worked his magic to get him out What did he go to prison for? Huh? What did he go to prison for? Man, we ain't got enough time. Oh, uh, we got a lot of new teammates. I ain't seen him much growing up. Let's just say that. Wouldn't we'll tell you if LeBron has too much power with the Lakers. Next. Oh, speak for yourself. You ever watch Snowfall? <laughs> <laughs> you know what the is? <laughs> The Lakers roster had a major facelift recently, so L.A. of us, and it seems like LeBron is happy about all the moves. He posted an image of all his new teammates on Instagram. And according to the L.A. Times, he had a dinner at his house with Anthony Davis and Russell Westbrook two weeks before the trade was announced. And let's not forget, his good friend Carmelo Anthony is his teammate now as well. Joined now by Fox NBA analyst Slick Rick the Buker, but I chose because LeBron has too much power with the Lakers. Nah, he ain't got too much power, but the kicker is, with great power comes great responsibility. And LeBron James, with all this power, means you got a responsibility to be right. And my question is, has LeBron James been right as it pertains to structuring a roster? I love LeBron James. Y'all know it's my favorite basketball player in the league. Eh, right there with Giannis. Depends on the day. <laughs> um, but I'm confused. Let me look at Slick. Let me look at Slick. Let me, let me look at my dog. Mm. Slick, I'm confused because THT... He just signed a three-year, $32 million deal. Obviously, that's because of LeBron James. If you all do not remember back in December, LeBron James tweets. I'm telling you right now, this kid is flat out special. LeBron James has been THT's biggest advocate. But Slick, I'm confused because THT only played 
12 minutes a game in the playoffs. Slick, I'm confused because THT didn't even log a minute in game three or game four of the playoffs. Slick, I'm confused because THT only played 48 minutes total. So LeBron James, the power to give THT $32 million <laughs> over three years. I'm not saying it's a wrong decision. It's just a confusing decision. I'll keep going. Hmm. LeBron James had the power to bring his homeboy, Dwayne Wade, to Cleveland in August, I believe, or November of 2018. But slick, Dwayne Wade, he ends up starting or playing the fewest minutes per game ever. And before you know it, by February, Dwayne Wade is no longer on the Cleveland Cavaliers roster. Great power comes great responsibility. I will end like this. You don't mix work and pleasure. Oh, oh. You're never supposed mm. to do that. Oh. You're never supposed mm. to do that. Wow. I'm currently we're doing it. My assistant is my homie. Like, that's been my, one of my closest friends for the last five years. But I have been cautioned. Acho, don't mix work with pleasure. Because the problem is, if you start to work with your friends, what happens when y'all have a work conflict? Does the work conflict trump the friend conflict? Does the friend conflict trump the work conflict? LeBron James, he doesn't have too much power because he is deserving of the power. But he does have too much responsibility. Mm. Acho, I've never known you to pick nits, but I feel as if that's what we have going on here. Great power, with great power comes great responsibility, yes, but it doesn't necessarily come with perfection. He's Ooh. not going to get every one of them Thank right. And the only correct answer is no, he does not, absolutely does not have too much power. Because, one... LeBron James is the only reason that Anthony Davis is currently in a Lakers uniform. Two, he's the only reason that the Lakers have a title in the last 11 years. And three, he's the only reason there's any hope that this, whatever it is, this amalgam of, I have to laugh when Marcellus said they had a facelift. That's generally what happens when you're really old, you get a facelift. This, this concoction that they've put together, he's the only reason that anybody believes that it has any chance of working this season. So I don't begrudge him any of that power. Now, will the franchise be standing on the side of the road with its thumb out, with all of its belongings and hefty bags at its feet, looking like it's a couple days from its last meal and needing a shower? <laughs> yes, that's generally where franchises end up when you give LeBron James all of the power. But the franchise will also be asked, well, was it that was it worth worth that weekend in Vegas, you know, mm. in the penthouse with mm. the high rollers once again tasting the good life? Mm. And the franchise will say, you betcha. So uh, there's a price that comes with giving LeBron James all the power, but he also has delivered every time he has been given it. So I am not going to begrudge it, nor do I think the, wrong, the Lakers are wrong in giving it. I'm with you, Slick. Uh, he doesn't have too much power. Uh, Acho knows this from his playing experience, too, that they don't even give you power. You earn it. You take it. They don't give you jack. So LeBron James has been responsible with the power that he's had in the NBA so far. Matter of fact, he's had it since high school. Let's be real about LeBron James. And everywhere he goes, he makes this promise and delivers on this promise. We're going to win a conference championship. We're going to the finals, and we may win it all. Think about everywhere LeBron James has been. Cleveland the first time. They are in the finals. With what? With who? Then he goes and makes up a super team. Now, he wins two chips there. Then he goes back to Cleveland, gives them their first title, tells Andrew Wiggins, you go somewhere, bring me Kevin Love, and makes it happen. First title for Cleveland. Then he comes to L.A., as you said, Slick, over a decade drought in terms of championships. The Lakers? Decade drought? And LeBron James all of a sudden brings in Anthony Davis, and then now they're champions once again. He always delivers on that conference championship or NBA championship. So now you look at LeBron James in totality and you start to look at some of the other power moves he's done. I think every NBA player would applaud LeBron James for being the windshield, for being the pioneer that took all of the criticism and all of the heat for making super teams fashion. Think about what LeBron James has done now. He makes people that are as loyal as a Damian Lillard 
Damian Lillard now have to contemplate and have to deal with questions about him going somewhere and joining the super team. Steph Curry, Mr. Bay Area, is dealing with questions until he signed his second Supermax deal. The point is LeBron James ushered in a power move that was beneficial to all, not just his teammates, not just his organization, but the NBA as a whole from the player's perspective. So I look at LeBron James and his power moves. The only one that didn't work, if you want to say that, is that he designed a team in Cleveland that was supposed to beat the San Antonio Spurs and then, oops, got blindsided by the Golden State Warriors. But he still beat a 73-win team in the Golden State Warriors. LeBron James, everywhere he goes, he delivers on his promise. Not too much power because he is responsible with it. Yeah, to Marcellus's point, there's been a number of other te- uh, other players as a result of LeBron James who have been given similar power. Mm-hmm. Kawhi Leonard with the Clippers. He yeah. made a demand that Paul George was going to be his teammate. They made it happen. He, he's been given all sorts of, of leeway. Uh, James Harden in Houston, in terms of who he wanted, didn't want Chris Paul, want Russ Westbrook. There's been any number of guys, KD and Kyrie to this point in Brooklyn, any number of guys have been given similar power and authority within their franchises to build the team around them, to have that influence. And none of them have delivered to the way uh, in the way that LeBron James has. So uh, the idea of giving players that kind of control and authority and what it does to your franchise and is it ultimately worth it? That's a question and a subject for another day. But LeBron James, I can't argue with the fact that uh, LeBron James has delivered every time he has been given that leeway. But of course he's delivered. He's LeBron James. The question for me, fellas, is not has LeBron James delivered? Will LeBron James deliver? The question, Slick, you have to ask yourself is, I don't know, did he or could he have done more? Think about it. LeBron James, Mm. he chose to keep Kuzma. As Ingram walks, his heart walks, his ball walks. Remember, Ingram walks and becomes the most improved player in the NBA. Ingram walks and he becomes a Western Conference All-Star. Kuzma stays and he's the laughingstock of the Lakers. LeBron James is the longest tenured Laker and he's been there for three years. So if LeBron James has been in control since he got to L.A., which he has, and he's the longest tenured player on that roster, and he's been there for three years, that turnover is a sign of some bad decision-making roster-wise. LeBron James to be greatest basketball player of all time. But that's a sign, Slick. If you have 100% turnover in a 36-month span, roughly, then... You ain't necessarily doing things right as it pertains to building. You just going from one house. Oh, let me leave that to another house. Uh Talk to me, Slick. Okay. Talk to me. Uh, Well, but uh, should we go down the list of franchises that have had similar turnover and have not had a ring to show for it? Hello. I mean, there have been plenty of teams that have been searching. The Houston Rockets have been searching for that answer. Any number of teams have been searching for the combination that is going to deliver them a championship, the Portland Trailblazers, the Boston Celtics, you name it, they've been searching for it. There's only been one guy in the last three years that has had that kind of turnover that has actually delivered a championship. So uh, even the Milwaukee Bucks sort of stayed the course. They added one or two pieces and they made it happen. The Toronto Raptors added Kawhi Leonard and they made it happen. Yes, the Lakers have had severe turnover. And as I said at the very beginning, I don't like where they're going to end up. And I don't believe that this latest experiment is going to work. But winning that championship in the bubble earned LeBron James all sorts of credit that he can spend now however he wants. Because I dare say, if you went to the Phoenix Suns right now Mm. and you said, we're mortgaging our future. But you know what? We got that ring with Chris Paul. Yep. Do you think they'd take it? Hell yes, they would <laughs> take it. That's how much the ring means. Yeah, I mean, LeBron James is batting four for four in terms of destination. So how can you argue with the results? 
I mean, it's funny in this world today, everyone's talking about their voice. Everyone has a voice. Well, LeBron James is handing out microphones because before LeBron James, these players didn't have the same amount of voice and volume. But now they are out there getting super max deals left and right. Guys are taking short term deals to leverage owners. Guys are creating the teams that they want, engineering them with leverage because LeBron James went out there in that button down in the YMCA and said, I'm taking my talents to South Beach. LeBron James ushered in this new movement. So y'all better pay some respect to LeBron James. Last thing I want to say is to my boy Acho, who told me not to mix work and pleasure. Now, Acho, you know, full disclosure for everyone at home, we knew each other before we worked together. So we were friends. And now we work together. Are you saying this is not going to work together? Because, yeah, look at your face. Oh, oh okay. So now you want to mix friends and mix business. We're hardly friends. Huh? We haven't hung out yet. That is we're, you we're problem. You always wow. out of town. We're Indian friends here. adjacent. <laughs> we are friends adjacent. Wow. And that, yeah, hey, Slick, I got, hey, I got the ammo over here to kill him. Plus, my sister's my assistant, and she's more than my friend. She's my family. I always hate when people say that, don't mix business with pleasure. You know why? Because you with someone you're cool with can actually go all the way with them. Acho, tell your best friend who's your assistant everything you're really thinking. It's those strangers you got to look out for, not the people closest to you. Coming up, Cindy McGuire. Where did we just go? <laughs> East won gold in hurdles for Team USA. Yes, she did. Find out if that was one of the most impressive moments in the Olympics. I messed that up, but that's next on Speak for Yourself. Speak for yourself. I'm Marcel Squad. He's Emmanuel Acho. I love you. See that overcorrection right there? All right, let's head to Tokyo where we have a lot of great moments in the Olympic pool, including Caleb Dresser winning five gold medals. Good Lord, in swimming. Suni Lee took gold in the women's all around in gymnastics, and Kevin Durant. Kevin Durant scored 29 points to lead Team USA to the semifinals. Yep. So, Acho. I know you're a track guy, but what have you been most impressed with so far in the Olympics? So, you know your boy, you know your boy, you know your boy, you know your boy, I'm a track guy. So, of mm. all the impressive things, and I've seen some incredible individual performances, the most impressive performance thus far on the track this Olympic season. So, we're going track. Track. I'm okay. going track. The most impressive performance thus far in the track and field Olympic season is the collective performance of the Jamaicans. Oh, yeah. Taking yes, one, yes, yes. two, and three for good measure with a cherry on top in the women's 100-meter finals. I've said this. Mm. Jamaica has a population of 2.9 million people. That's roughly the same population of Chicago, the city of Chicago. Mm. But somehow, some way, Jamaica shows up with the three fastest women in the world. There are 1.2 billion people on the planet, women ages 18 to 38. That's mm. roughly the age range of women that have the still physical talent to qualify for a race like that. 1.2 billion people, roughly 310 million or so Americans. Jamaica got 2.9 million, less than 1% of the population of the USA, and they took one, two, and three? Give me Clean, that. sweet? Give me that. So ain't nothing more impressive than that. Oh, I got something more impressive. Talk to me, that. talk to me, talk to me. Uh, I have two. Uh-oh. Give me one first. Give me one at a time. Well, I they, can't take they, them both. They go together, <laughs> brother. You can't separate these two. Okay, what's the most respected? You're a purist. Yes, sir. And you're not just a track fan. You're a purist. Yes, sir. Yes, Get sir. off yes, your sir. lawn. <laughs> you're a track purist. Oh, Okay, what's the most respected event in track and field? It's either the 400 hurdles or the 800. It ain't no either. <laughs> it's the 400 hurdles. And I have two world record performances Ooh. in the 400 hurdles, men and women. The Kirsten Warholm. Yes, sir. And Sydney McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. Oh, the future is bright mm -hmm. in track and field. They, they both broke their own world records. What, what, here's the thing. Here's what's most impressive. Not that they broke their own world records. Not the fact that they even set their own world records. It's the fact that the way that they ran yes, their race. Talk about it, sir. Okay. Talk well, about it. I'm going to start off with this quote. Let's just get it out there. Go ahead. Don't get bored with success. Mm -hmm. Coaches always say that. Something's working. I know everyone always tries to reinvent it. You know, let me do something else. He's like, no, no. Don't get bored with success. It's working. Just keep going. As coach used to do this. Run the play back. Run it back. They are running it back. Let's talk about the races. Warholm's race. This is how I learned how to run a track. Set, go. Run as hard as you can, figure it out at the end. <laughs> and he did that. Orion Benjamin ran a beautiful race, beautiful race. calculated race, mm -hmm. because he knew what he was going against. 
and he almost got there. You broke it down too. What was it? The ninth hurdle. Ninth hurdle. Talk him. Talk so about. We it. got to the ninth hurdle, and uh, Warholm starts reaching. Yeah, and you know how it is. Reaching does not look when you're overextending that stride. It might look fast, but it's not fast. Nah. Why, Benjamin? I thought he was gonna get him. Still, I thought he was gonna get him. And he came up just short because my coach used to always say, if you get out fast, not only do you have greater distance between you and them, mm -hmm. but in your mind. Their mind, they're thinking that they got to go catch up. That's exerting too much energy. Yep. We talk about Sydney on my second lap because I know you got a second lap. Uh, my second lap is oh. this. Well, I'm gonna have to prelude your Sydney take. Can oh. I? You go, go can ahead. I prelude go your ahead. Sydney we take? Right. Because right. if I can take a little bit of the rib real quick, Sydney McLaughlin had the world record that she set at USA's champ at Olympic trials, mm -hmm. but she broke her own world record by half a second. That's a whole lot of. <laughs> How you break your own world record oh. a month later oh. by half of a second. Before the race cell, she walks out onto the track, and I saw the screen. I took a screen grab because she just had this look in her eye. Ooh. And all I tweeted was, and we, and we ain't got the clip, oh, okay, I ain't tell okay. the producers, okay. but all I tweeted was, <laughs> Sydney got that look in her eye like she's about to break a world record. Damn. You know, mm. you know when mm. you see somebody and they mm. just got that look that says, mm. I'm coming, mm. and ain't no backing down. Mm. She had that look that was like, I'm coming, and ain't no backing down. <laughs> hey, look, look, look. Let's just talk about who she ran against, a champion. Let's talk about the race she ran against Muhammad, a champion, and a veteran. Mm -hmm. Sydney's 21. Yes, sir. I met Sydney when she was like 16, mm -hmm. running against my daughter. Uh, let's just say she's faster than my daughter. Okay, so anyway, they were racing each other. This is in New York. We're at the Armory, and I'm out there. It was amazing. Anna Cockrell, all these, uh -huh. you know, they all running, and you can just see who's going to keep going and keep going. Sydney also in the Olympics in high school. So we understand that she had the pedigree. We understand that she was destined for this moment, but not like this. Mm -hmm. She's 21. Running against a champion in a race where she was behind, not the ninth hurdle, the tenth, tenth hurdle. hurdle. Yes, sir. She lost the hurdles. When they were done with the hurdles. That's a bar. She, she lost the hurdles, but she won the race. She won the race. She won the race because she's been running the 100s all year long. And running the 100s gets your quick twitch muscles, mm -hmm. gets your mind activated a little faster. She knew she had the foot speed. All she had to do was be in striking distance coming off the 10th hurdle. Muhammad ran a beautiful race because she knew Sydney's behind me and Sydney's going to come because she's the world record holder. And just to be 21, to have the discipline, to have the understanding of how to run the race, and then the trust. When you get off your last hurdle, you... You panic if you're not in front because you're like, we're right there at the finish mm -hmm. line. What's going to happen? She didn't trusted panic. Herself. She just trusted herself at 21 and won and got my homage. Since this oh. show has been hijacked into track and field live, <clears throat> I got to ask you a question. Okay. What world record 400 meter, 400 meter hurdle race was more impressive? Of the two? Sydney's or Kirsten's? Kirsten's. Why? Um... Golly, let me, one, it happened first. So then that helped, that helped, cause I was just like, ah. And then I saw, I'm not gonna lie, Sydney's amazing, but I already knew she was gonna be amazing. What Araya and Kirsten, I was like, this I thought Kirsten was the favorite, E1, but I was like, Araya's gonna give him all. I thought there was a closer one-two competition than I did with Sydney and Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cause Muhammad's 31. Mm -hmm. Like, she's not coming down the hill. She ran a personal best. She, she ran what would have been a world record. Yeah, yeah, she did everything, but Sydney is like the LeBron of that, that event, that sport right there. I'm gonna say Sydney McLaughlin's record was more impressive for this reason. She okay. ran the 400 meters, run lap, one lap, if y'all are just now getting into track and field, over hurdles yep. in 51 seconds and 46 milliseconds. 51.46 was her time, 51, 46, 400 right. meters over hurdles. Yep. That would have qualified for the Olympic semifinal oh, oh, in the open 400 without hurdles. So what how fast Sydney ran while running and jumping 10 times, Still would have placed her in the top, what is it, 16 or 24 women in the world okay. running one lap without jumping. For that reason, Cell, I think Sydney's performance is the most impressive individual performance mm. of the Olympics. So okay, far. now now you don't lost. Uh oh. Okay, I didn't want to do this, but you know I love a competition. Okay, Sydney ran a 5146. Yes, sir. The world record in the open is 47.6. Okay, yes, so sir. So that's like four seconds, basically. Yes, a little sir. under four seconds. Are you ready for this? Talk to me. Kirsten Warhol ran a 45. What was it? 45 what? 45.94. 45.94. 94. 45, 94. 45, 94. The open is 43.03. 
2.91. Let me get into this to you in non-track terms. Somebody is running without hurdles, and the fastest dude that ever did it didn't do it three seconds faster. But golly, somebody ran an open 45 in the Olympic prelims just to try and qualify and didn't. And this dude just ran that with hurdles. 2.91 seconds versus Sydney, which is four seconds. So just because of the disparity, I give you hers that. is greater. I give you that. So I got to say, I give you that. I got to throw another name in the hat. And I don't even know if y'all ready because I didn't tell nobody about this. We might have had a graphics. What you got? A thing move. Oh, 19 year old, uh, Texas A&M. Yes. She wasn't even like yes. nominated for, you know, over at the other network for the best college athlete. She wasn't even nominated for that award. That's but correct. a thing move. Says the American record mm. wins a gold medal mm. in the 800 meters mm. against what? Seasoned veterans mm. at 19 years of age. Says mm. the American record. I think that a thing moves performance was the third greatest individual performance mm. on the track to Kirsten and to Sydney because at 19 to run the 800 and people don't realize. You asked me at the beginning of the bot. Mm. You said what is the toughest event? You didn't ask yeah, me toughest, yeah, but you the one with the Purest, most respected. People say either the 400 hurdles because that's a one lap full sprint jumping over hurdles, or people say the 800, 800 because the 800 is two laps fully sprinting in theory, but there's a lot of mental psychology that goes into it. Yeah. It's a psychological race, the 800. Mm -hmm. Do you want to get in front, but then they're going to draft out for you? Do you want to just sit back in third or fourth and then try to kick at the end, mm -hmm. but you don't want to get boxed mm -hmm. in? This 19-year-old simply said, I'm going to sprint. For two the consecutive laps, and you all are not going to catch me. Right. And that is exactly what she did. And I love that you brought her up, and I hate her. And I hate, and I'm going to say it to you, where the camera? I don't like you right now because she's selfish. She could have ran the 400 too. That was the whole way. She runs an open 48. What Here's the, the thing. Here's the thing. That too? You and I right now need to make declarations. A thing move. Sydney McLaughlin, the time is now. Time Stop with the 400 hurdles. Yeah. Stop with the open 800. Yeah. The 400 is the premier event after mm. the 100. Mm. The time is now. You done set the American record of thing, Moot. Yeah, yeah. You done set the, uh, the world record, Sydney McLaughlin. Yeah. Hey, don't yeah. be scared now. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. You know what? I would be nice, though. Y'all can run them other events, but y'all both got to run the and they go break that world record. <laughs> coming up, big names are coming and going during the NBA free agency frenzy. Woo. We'll tell you our biggest winners next. Don't speak for yourself. Man, she could have <laughs> Let's get back to free agency. NBA free agency, that is. It started a couple days ago, and there have already been a number of big-time moves. Kyle Lowry leaving Toronto for Miami. Mike Lowry. Y'all got to think that later. <laughs> Russell Westbrook is joining forces with LeBron and Anthony Davis. And Trey Young, Ice Trey, agreed to a mass extension with the Hawks. Max extension over $200 million. Eat, That's eat. Marcellus Wiley money. <laughs> Slick Rick. Back with us, Marcel. Who's the biggest winner so far in free agency? Oh, you just talked about him. You just went to the Windy City in your comparison with Jamaica. It's Chicago, the Bulls. My goodness, Chicago Bulls. What a haul this free agency period. First of all, you came back to my home and grabbed Compton's finest, DeMar DeRozan, in the house. DeMar DeRozan, eight straight seasons, 20-plus points per game average. You now look at DeMar DeRozan. Zach Levine, who's a beast trying to get the gold for the Olympic team right now in Tokyo. Nikola Vucevic. Don't make me at the Vucevic out here because you see what he did last year. Goodness. 21 and 11 in 26 games. Now you add all that up, and this is how it's going to really get over the top. They got a playmaker, or at least someone who can make plays for you. That's Lonzo Ball. Yeah, y'all remember him, L.A.? Y'all remember him, Lakers? Everybody was like, he's a castaway. Lonzo Ball out there eating. Lonzo Ball is just silent baller. Shot 38% from the three-point line last year. Career high, almost 15 points a game, and still can throw them dimes. So I'm looking at a team that last year, obviously under 500, 11th in the East, 31 and 41 who has the arrow pointing up, not just because of these names and acquisitions, but for two other reasons. Top 10 team, rebounding, three-point defense, field goal percentage, efficient team. More importantly, they won six of their last eight games. Hmm. Did I watch a team a year ago win eight straight games in the bubble and become a, not only a playoff team, but a oh, team that was in the oh. finals? Man, is there another team that those can... Dots? As coach, you always say, that is strong. Because we could start stronger. And that looks like the Chicago Bulls. <laughs>
<laughs> I liked your take until the end. So, um, the yeah. biggest winner in free agency, ladies and gentlemen, the one and only Chris Paul. Oh, because Chris wow. Paul got four years, $120 million. He's going to be making $40 million at the age of 40. But here's why he's the biggest winner because Chris Paul this year caught the exact same break that Anthony Davis caught during the COVID year. What break is that, you ask? Anthony Davis, during the shortened COVID season, he had us all convinced that he actually could play an entire season and a playoff run healthy. Mm. And as a result, we believed the lie that Anthony Davis could stay healthy throughout the playoffs and a regular season until this year we realized, wait a second, we've been fooled, we've been bamboozled. <laughs> Chris Paul has done the same thing, y'all. 2015, hamstring injury in the playoffs. He missed two games. They losing seven games to the Rockets. 2016, hand injury against the Blazers. They end up losing in six games. 2018, hamstring injury. Y'all remember this when Chris Paul is now on the Rockets. They're playing Golden State. They're up 3-2. His hamstring, they end up losing in seven. Chris Paul has shown us when he makes those incredibly deep playoff runs, he's gotten hurt. He almost got hurt this year. Mm. Against the Lakers, you all remember the shoulder injury. He missed a little bit of time, ends up missing the game, if I'm mm. not mistaken. But he catches COVID. He catches a break. You catch COVID. We don't, we don't knock anybody that gets COVID. It's a global pandemic. We're not going to knock you, Chris Paul, for getting COVID. But we're not going to be ignorant to the fact that you got about 10 days off. You end up missing two games. Then you drop 41 points <clears> in the closeout <throat> game against the Clippers, your playoff high of this playoffs. But then you keep playing, and in the NBA Finals against the Bucks, you don't physically wither away, but statistically you start to wither away. You still end up getting four years, $120 million. You caught the same break that Anthony Davis caught. I love Chris Paul. I'm a fan of Chris Paul, so I'm glad he caught the break. And that's why he's the biggest winner so far in free agency. Hmm. I almost went with you there, Acho, if it weren't for the fact that that fourth year of that $120 million contract is not guaranteed. Fair. And not all of the third year is either. So mm -hmm. it reduces what he got. Yes, he hit it at the right time, and you point out exactly how he was able to kind of fool us and what he was able to accomplish. But once again... There's only one correct answer to this question, and it is Duncan McBride Ooh. Robinson. Because <laughs> I dare you to name anyone from the state of Maine who has made $90 million, <laughs> other than maybe Stephen King, the novelist, okay? <laughs> his, his prospects were so bad coming out of college mm. that he was thinking of coming over to this side of the microphone before even attempting the NBA. Wow. Div Division three uh, college player, that's where he started, undrafted, signed a two-way deal with the Miami Heat, which meant he was going to spend half his time in the G League, which he did, and then ultimately signed a three-year, $3 million deal. He's going from that to a five-year, $90 million deal. Mm. That is an Emmy Acho come up right there. <laughs> <laughs> there were... 81 players who averaged more points than Duncan McBride Robinson this year. One of them being Kendrick Nunn, his teammate, who just signed a two-year, $10 million deal with the Lakers. Mm. Two years, $10 million. Five years, $90 million. I think I know who came out on top on that one. And you got guys like Kelly Oubre Jr. and Dennis Schroeder who are still looking for work. My goodness. Nobody, <laughs> nobody did it better. Nobody struck it richer than Duncan Robinson. Slick, let me ask you this, big dog, because obviously I am uh, a basketball fan. Uh, since I retired from the NFL, fell in love with basketball once again. I don't want to sound like a hater. I'm not a hater. I'm glad they get their money. But explain to me, because you've been covering yeah. the game since I've been alive. How does a Duncan Robinson get a five-year, $90 million deal when a guy like you said, whether it be a nun or a plethora of other Schroeder. players, like how does somebody strike that much if they don't appear to be that valuable? There's a couple of things, but it's, it's right place, right time more than anything else. It's, a, it's having a skill 
that is valued within the structure of a particular team. And Duncan Robinson obviously has demonstrated to the Miami Heat that he is going to be focused on continuing to get better. He's going to, he's going to play his role. And at 6'7", and being the dead-eye shooter that he is, there's, uh, look, again, right place, right time. Being a shooter, a three-point shooter who can get his shot off with a team like the Miami Heat that desperately needs that spacing for guys like Jimmy Butler and Bam Adebayo, it's right place, right time. And the fact that he was willing to take a five-year deal, I think the way the Miami Heat look at it as, we'll make this up on the back end. Because his skill is not going to dep depreciate. It's going to be good for us. And the deeper we go into this contract, the more worth we're going to get out of what we're paying him. The jump from a million to 15 million the first year, that's pretty steep. But as this contract goes on, it only goes up in increments of a couple million. And their feeling is, we'll, we'll make it up on the back end. Yeah, it's crazy, man. He just benefits from shooter's privilege. And we all know what that is. That means you can shoot that ball 41%. You know Carmelo shot just a tick better than him last year? Didn't shoot as many times, but he certainly shot a higher percentage. Go Duncan Robinson. You know I applaud when you get your bread. But let me hammer down the point of the Chicago Bulls because I left out somebody, headband man, Alex Caruso. Don't admit it. Valuable. We'll do all the dirty things. We'll do all the things that you don't want to do. Alex Caruso is up to that task. It looks like a complete team in the Eastern Conference. Now, obviously, Brooklyn Nets are in the Eastern Conference. They stay healthy. They're the favorites. They're going to win the East. However, outside of them, and of course the champions, got to respect Milwaukee, it's wide open. You can say Atlanta. You can say Philadelphia. You can start naming these teams, but come on. Don't act like Chicago can't make a leap to at least get into the bottom of that tier. So they're not tier one. Acho. They may not even be tier two, but they are coming with all of these new additions. Go ahead, Slick. What you, what you got, man? Celis, I love, I love what the Chicago Bulls have done. Okay. I think they've made themselves a bona fide playoff team. But goodness gracious, you got to slow that elevator down, brother. You are taking it right <laughs> to the top. You told they me they have the Brooklyn even... elevator. How'd that look? It looks amazing until it got unplugged. But the okay, Brooklyn hold on, hold on, hold on. I don't slow it down. Are we, are we, really, are we really comparing Alex Caruso and Lonzo Ball to Kyrie Irving and, James and Kevin Durant? Yeah, yeah he tried. Or he James Rose? Harden. I, look, I love what the Bulls what have done. Mean? And I like it especially because I think the numbers work. Like, they yeah. got these guys in their prime yes. with really good numbers. They're not paying outsized contracts. So... I like all of it. Zach Levine, what he's doing with Team USA, again, another plus. Mm -hmm. These guys compliment him. I love all of it. I just, <laughs> brother, we, we got to slow our roll just a little bit. If they are now a contender, it's a little too much. All right, there's Brooklyn here, there's Milwaukee, Atlanta, and then here you come, Chicago, take tier three. Coming up, Trey Lance is being called tremendous during tra training camp. We'll tell you what the Niners should do with their rookie quarterback next on Speak for Yourself. Tremendous, huh? The quarterback controversy is brewing in the Bay Area. Bay Area! Jimmy G, better watch out. Being called the starter, but Trey Lance took a rep with the first team Tuesday. Here we go. And at one point, he made a throw that was described as, quote, video game nonsense. 49ers GM John Lynch gave his rookie quarterback some high praise. Take a listen. He's looked tremendous. He really has. Uh, you know, I think what's been most impressive about Trey, everyone wants to talk about physical traits, but the way he approaches his job, he's a pro uh, in its truest sense. Got a lot of guys who love the game that are willing to do the necessary things to prepare. And I think Trey really uh, is an embodiment of that. And uh, he's looking good on the field, too. Gotcha. This is the 49ers do about tremendous Trey Lance. It's simple. Start him. No, uh -huh. not that simple. It's simple. Oh, um, okay. it, it's complicated if you do not understand the head coach, Kyle Shanahan. Why do I say that? Mm. Rookies, quarterbacks. The biggest thing rookie quarterbacks struggle with is their system process. Rookie quarterbacks struggle not with their arm, not with their legs, not with seeing over the offensive line. It's with <laughs> computing defenses. Mm. In college, you see basic cover three defenses. Two corners cover a third of the field. The safety covers the other third of the field. Cover three. You see, basic cover two defenses. Two safeties cover a half of the field. Two corners cover the other halves of the field, but the lower portion. Cover two. You see man-to-man -man defenses. 
Y'all know what that is. Every man got a man. But in the NFL, all of a sudden, you start seeing some numbers you ain't never seen before. Let me hear. Cover six? What's cover six? What that do? That's cover two on one side, cover four on another side, huh? Uh, you start seeing cover five? What's cover five? Then they start adding words. Black? White? Why well, I got to get racial. Black five? What, what, what they doing out here? It's like all the complications and complexities. However, uh. with Kyle Shanahan's cell, he does a marvelous job simplifying the game for his quarterback. Oh. I remind you, I remind all y'all, Jimmy G leads the NFL in yak, meaning Jimmy G's receiver, yards after catch, meaning Jimmy G's receivers, they actually do more work than Jimmy G does. Jimmy G throws a, a oh, dump stop. off pass or a check down, Not what and that the means. receivers run, do, run, <laughs> run further. Not what that At means. a minimum, what it means is this. They throw shorter routes. They do throw shorter routes. And Kyle Shanahan does a very good job of making for easier completions. Yeah. At a minimum, we can deduce Cause, that. Yeah, because they're a run-based team. Play-action passes is usually going to be short Bingo. intermediate. Stop doing that. I'm just saying. over there playing I'm, Jimmy I'm, G I'm, like he can't I do nothing. I do nothing. I do nothing. I do nothing. Right. Right. I do nothing. I'm listening to you. I do nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is this. Kyle Shanahan simplifies his offense for his quarterbacks, regardless Facts. of how good they are. If rookie quarterbacks' biggest struggle is complexities of defenses and Kyle Shanahan's biggest strength is simplification of offenses, it's a great combination for Trey Lance to go ahead and start great right away. Point. Great, great point. That is a marriage made in heaven. And you know also is a marriage made in heaven? The fact that the general manager, John Lynch, and Kyle Shanahan are on the same page, lockstep. That's a problem for you if you're Jimmy G. Think about this. What should they do with your ministry, Lance? I say you let them sit on the bench. Mm -hmm. Make sure that processor can process. Mm -hmm. This is how you know when you just keep throwing them into situations in practice, when the bullets aren't live, and you want to make sure that he's understanding this. You learn so much from the NFL game playing it, but close second is being right there and then going through the mental process, the mm -hmm. mental reps. That's why our Tom Brady, who sat down in year one, you could just go through the list of people who sat down. Peyton Manning didn't sit down, and boy, like you said, that processor was getting lit up. But that's not what's going to happen here. They're not going to listen to me. I've been trying to tell him all along, sit him down. If he's so special, it will shine through. But I'm going to tell you what's really going to happen. First is already occurring is the hype. This is how it goes. You start hearing these adjectives and descriptions and descriptors of tremendous Trey Lance, and then they let that just go. They let that run, and that's going to be in the offseason. But these bullets aren't live. So then all of a sudden, you're going to hear like a Kyle Shanahan come out and say, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's temper this. Uh, let's bring this down to these expectations and chill. And then the preseason is going to start. And all they need is a validation that they can sell to the fans. Because right now, they're ready to turn the page on Jimmy G. One, because they're like, Jimmy G, you're limited. But two, his dead cap is $2.4 million. They're looking like, mm, Jimmy, this is a perfect way to say goodbye to you with that dead cap number. But until Trey Lance shows the world, not just us in video spying on him in preseason practices, the world sees this on a football field against opponents that he doesn't know what they're doing, this won't come to fruition. I'm rooting for Trey Lance, so I hope it does come to fruition. But in reality, you should let him sit and learn from Jimmy G. Yeah, I mean, I'm not mad at that take because I've always said quarterbacks that get to sit and get to learn, they end up doing better in the long term. It's yeah. as though they're catapulted forward in their careers. Lamar Jackson, he wasn't thrust into starting right away. I don't know if he learned from Flacco, but at a minimum, he learned from Flacco's mistakes. Patrick Mahomes, he wasn't thrust into action right away. Aaron Rodgers, he wasn't thrust into action right away. Yeah. Tom Brady, he wasn't thrust into action right away. Yeah. Those are our last four MVPs in the NFL. Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson. Mm -hmm. And all of them had the privilege of sitting first. So I think you're right. But so what's crazy is year by year, the NFL changes. And right now, more than ever, because it's the most recent year, you got to win right now. Why would you want to have a Trey Lance yeah. who is more physically talented than Jimmy G, mm. who is probably healthier than Jimmy G, more capable than Jimmy G, mm. but you going to keep him? Like, why you go buy it? Oh, I Imagine this, though, because oh, you okay. used to be that dude. We talked about this oh. off air, man. I was with Charles Woodson this weekend, a great Charles Woodson, well, y'all. Yeah. And he's like, hey, you work with that dude? I was like, no, I work with Marcellus Vernon Wiley. He's like, no, you work with that dude? I was like, I mean, I call him Vernon by nickname, if anything. He's like, no, he used to be that dude. Okay, so let's go back to when you was that dude. Oh, man. You wouldn't go to the store, not even a store. You wouldn't go off Melrose and, mm. and buy you a fresh pair of kicks, mm. have a party that night, but not wear the kicks to the party. Ooh. 
Why would you go wear your creased Air Force Ones that got scuffed when you walked up and tripped on the stairs when you just bought a fresh pair of kicks? Yeah. You mortgaged a little bit of your future to buy a kick. Because you didn't go to any store. You went to a consignment store. Oh, did And you went to a consignment store, so you had to actually trade you in. You had to give them some. You had to give them some. Shop, you shop. had to trade in some <laughs> shoes that you liked in order for you to afford the fresh pair of kicks. Yeah. The Niners went to a consignment store, Sal, and they had to trade in a couple first-round picks. Yeah. They bought a Trey Lance, and you telling them to sit Trey Lance? They got a party tonight? Yeah. Don't make sense, sir. It doesn't. It, boy, don't take me back to that mindset. I used to do exactly that. <laughs> but I also didn't give a damn what I wore because I was that dude. Boy, I would it no matter what. Here we go. Let's talk about this. This is why you don't play Trey Lance, because the only year Jimmy G was able to start from beginning to end, what happened? They went to the Super Bowl. They had a lead in the fourth quarter. And Jimmy G wasn't the reason why they didn't win that game. I know a lot of people want to talk about the throw, and it was overthrown. Let's talk about that defense that was second rank. That gave up 10 points. They had a 10-point lead, I should say, and gave up all those points in the fourth quarter. So here's the thing. If we have Jimmy G, we got him on the books, $26.4 million cap hit this season. Base salary at $24.1 million. If he gives you a Super Bowl appearance, that's cheap. <sighs> There's an argument to keep Jimmy G around in the same role. There's an argument to say, put Trey Lance out there. But here's the problem with that argument. Josh Allen, MVP candidate. Yeah. How do he look his rookie year? Squaggle bus. Sam Darnold, talent coming out of high, uh, college. How do you look at his rookie year? Mm -hmm. How do you look at second year? How do you look at third year? Mitchell Trubisky. Eh. Carson Wentz, your boy. How do you look at his rookie year? What about Jared Goff? Like, number one pick, not Trey Lance. Number one pick. Point being, there's an argument on both sides, but since they pushed their chips all in, it seems like they're going to go with them. There's a small strength, if you're a Niners fan, to really want to... There's a small strength and argument to really want to start Trey Lance. And the, the small strength and argument that's often overlooked, first two games of the season against the Detroit Lions hmm. and against the Philadelphia Eagles. It's not just about who you're playing, <clears throat> but who is the people you're being compared to. Trey Lance isn't going to be compared to Aaron Rodgers on opening weekend. Uh, what is it? September 12th, I believe, is the opening Sunday. Or uh, Yeah, it should be September 12th. He's not going to be compared to Aaron Rodgers. Hmm. He's going to be compared to the person on the other side of the field. If you're Trey Lance, please compare me to Jared Goff, led by Dan Campbell, who just lost Kenny Galladay. Please compare me to him. If you're Trey Lance, please compare me to Jalen Hurts, led by Nick Sirianni and Devontae Smith, who have missed the three weeks prior off an MCL injury that he's currently recovering from. Please compare me to them. Mm. Furthermore, oh, my first two games are on the road, so I can't even get booed if I struggle. Mm. It's a perfect time mm. to start a rookie quarterback if mm. there ever was a time. Man. I think you won that one at the end right there. <laughs> he brought up the schedule. Coming up, Carmelo Anthony is joining his pal LeBron right here in L.A. We'll tell you if Melo is a good fit for the Lakers next on Speak for Yourself. So we're going to get to the Lakers have made a number of moves in free agency, including signing Carmelo Anthony to a one-year deal. Melo averaged just over 13 points a game with the second highest three-point percentage in his career last season with the Blazers. And we all know that the 10-time All-Star is good friends with King James. Slick Rick, Slickity Rick, is back with us. But, Sal, is Carmelo Anthony a good fit for the Lakers? Nope, he's a great fit for the Lakers. Um, I talk about that relationship. As you don't want to mix business and pleasure, I do, actually. I want to work with my friends because I know I can grab them. I know I can activate them. I know we can go to different limps than I can with just some stranger, just some other guy. That's why I work with you, Acho. We were friends before the show. What happened now to Whitlock, I question man? that, huh? What happened to Whitlock? He's still my friend. He texts me. He live way away, though. I don't know mm. what the hell. What you trying to say? He wasn't my friend before the show, though. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but you were. And now I look at you differently. Don't bring up Whitlock trying to distract me. I'm talking about you. <laughs> All right. Carmelo is friends with LeBron. LeBron's going to be able to tell Carmelo, come over, man. I got a bottle. It's open. It's red. We're going to drink this wine. We're going to talk about this. Oh, and Carmelo ain't going to have nothing bad to say, and LeBron won't either. Because Carmelo last year was a beast in his role. Averaged 13 and a half points a game, 41 from the three-point line, and 89 from the free throw line. Carmelo? Hmm, okay, respect that. You got to remember that the Lakers were bottom three. Bottom third, I should say, in three-point percentage and free throw percentage. So Carmelo's strengths fit in well with the Lakers' weaknesses. You look at Carmelo also as a catch-and-shoot shooter, that's what the Lakers need. Everyone's talking about what's Russell Westbrook's role going to be. One, bring the carbs, energy. Second, 
Hopefully the lane will open up. We'll figure out how we're going to play with you and Dwight and AD in that situation. But you remember Westbrook in Houston, how efficient he was off ball. I talked about this with you, Slick, how he had his highest field goal percentage in Houston. Now, we know a lot of that was play dynamics and how James Harden basically said, do what I don't want to do. And that was efficient for Russell Westbrook. But that's kind of the role he's going to be in in this situation with the Lakers. You put Carmelo Anthony, who still is getting buckets, still in New York with Chris Brickle every single day, it looks like, just shooting up the gym. We'll see how it plays out in terms of age, in terms of him having the full endurance for the entire season, because the Lakers are going to go far. But I think it's a great fit, Carmelo with the Lakers, helping them where they need the most. It's a good story, Marcellus. It's not a good fit. To have two of the Banana Boat crew members coming together, two guys who have been rivals since high school, the first and third picks in the same draft, guys who uh, physically have been compared to each other from the beginning of their career, all of that makes for a good story. But the fit, that's something else now because if they are playing together on the floor at the same time one of them is either going to have to play center or small forward Mm. now that may not be a problem offensively but defensively ooh, that is another issue altogether because If they're together on the floor and one of them's at center, it means that you're not going to have any rim protection. And if you have one of them at small forward, it means that you're going to be dragged into pick and rolls and it's not going to go good for you there either. So I love the story, but bringing them together at this point, (laughs) you're about 10 years too late in doing that. (laughs) So this is not going to get the Lakers where they want to go. And by the way, It's still the thought of LeBron and Carmelo. And this fit is so bad, you have to start delving into Russ Westbrook and Dwight Howard and how those pieces aren't going to fit either. So I just, the names and the expectations are not nearly going to meet what the actual production is. I co-sign. I co-sign you, Slick Rick. Wow. Um, But it's not even so much the fit for me, fellas. Let me harp in on a point I was telling y'all earlier. It's about... Business is about pleasure, sell. September 27th, 2017, that's when D. Wade gets weighed by the Bulls. Shortly thereafter, he signs with the Cavs. He starts three games. He doesn't like that he only starts three games, so there starts to become tension. Tension arises. Now, D. Wade's a great dude. You've met him, I've met him. And so he's like, you know what? I'll take a backup role. Backup roles only last so long when you got a starting mentality. By February 8th, he gets traded back to the Heat, and we know he goes on his fair war- well tour. But on the flip side, we've seen it happen with Melo before. Remember, he went to Houston. Mike D'Antoni, his old coach with the Knicks, was like, hey, come back. Let's run it back. You did great things with me in New York. Let's see what we can do. He plays 10 games in Houston. All of a sudden, he got beef with a GM. Next thing you know, he gets released, if I'm not mistaken. And then he just sits the rest of that season. And everybody's like, where's Melo? Bring Melo back. Melo has had the work relationship, business relationship fall short on him. LeBron has had it fall short on him. Those are the reasons I don't think it works. So what happens when Melo's only getting, I don't know, call it 15 minutes a game? Then he's going to Bron's house, Taco Tuesday! And they eating the the tacos, you know what I'm saying? LeBron chilling, doing his own thing. LeBron just dropped 40, 15, and 5 the game before. And Melo, he eating his tacos. LeBron trying to crack a joke. And Melo looking at Bron like, hey, big dog, you know, why Vogel ain't really playing me like he should be? All of a sudden, LeBron going to be like, (laughs) he going to hear that look. Like, wait a second, now you're doing too much. You're doing too much. I don't think it's a good fit because it's putting too much pressure and strain on a friendship. What? Here's the other part, uh, Joe. It's not so much the minutes. It's the shots. Mm, Now, Portland did a great job. Even though he was coming off the bench, per minute, his shots were equal to the number that he was taking in Oklahoma City as a starter. They did everything possible to feature Carmelo Anthony. And considering outside of Damian Lillard and some of the injuries that they had, C.J. McCollum being out for a while, etc., they were able to make that work. It ultimately wasn't a winning formula, <clears throat> but they made it work, and, uh, and, and certainly Melo was, was happy with everything that uh, occurred there. But now you got 
LeBron, you've got Anthony Davis, you got Russ Westbrook, and Carmelo Anthony. He's not going to be whatever minutes that he plays. He's not going to be getting 15 shots a game. And I dare say it's going to be few and far between where they're actually featuring situations where he's going to they're going to look to get him the ball and get him a shot. So uh, I just I have real questions. Just the whole demeanor of this team too. Dwight Howard in that happy go lucky style playing with Russ Westbrook. Carmelo and Trevor Ariza, Trevor Ariza being a guy who's all about you got to play the right way, you got to do the right things. I mean, it's just such a mixed bag. And Carmelo LeBron, no matter what their friendship may be, I don't see that overcoming all of the other things that will be going on with this team on top of the expectations. Because you yourself, Marcellus, you expect them to be right there at the top. They come into the gate with that expectation. And again, I look at the pieces and I look at the personalities and I look at the specific games and expectations. And it's just hard for me to see a positive result. It's not hard for me. Um, I know where we're starting from in, in premise, uh, a team that before injury last year, that was 21 and seven team that was coming off of a championship, a team that knows that this engine and this driving force is in its prime and it's Anthony Davis if he stays healthy. I also know that I'm seeing the best version of Carmelo ever from the three point line. I also know I'm I was seeing just the imitating the engine. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the engine of that. that yeah, yeah, that that's the engine. Team it be talking about. out though, but when it ain't, it's rolling. That thing can roll. So this is the best version of Carmelo from the three-point line, where the Lakers struggled last year. Best version of Carmelo from the free throw line ever, like in his career, highest percentages. And then offensive rating, you got to go back for Carmelo to 2013, 2014 season when Carmelo looked this good on the offensive end in terms of rating. All I'm saying is he's not asked to be okay. full-size Carmelo Anthony or super-size. This is a small order. We're asking a little of Carmelo, and then we're going to get a lot from Carmelo. It's a simple formula. Add that with LeBron and a winning team already. You got something special. Oh, go ahead, Slick. I'm sorry, I was cut you off. Do we do we want to look at do we want to look at defensive rating? Do we want to look at like, it ain't the last on his page. four years <laughs> where LeBron James's defensive rating has been the worst that it's been his entire career, or Car Carmelo Anthony the last yeah, two worse. years worst defensive rating of his entire year? I do, I believe they could potentially be better offensively than they were last year, but then what they were twenty. Second, 24th last year. So I would hope that they would be better. <laughs> but are they going to be number one in defense this year? No. No how? No. No way. And Melo and LeBron being on the floor at the same time defensively. Oh, my God. Fa Oof. Fast break heaven for Oof. the opposition. Ooh, that is a race between gravy and syrup. Huh? <laughs> it's like that. Who going to win that one? That is slow motion there. All right, I'm number one in defense because you got me on the ropes right now. Coming up, could Nick Foles be replacing Carson Wentz again? We'll tell you if that's a bad move for Wentz. Next, don't speak for yourself. Frank Reich says Carson Wentz's foot surgery showed no further complications, but he is still expected to miss between 5 and 12 weeks. A number of names have been dropped to take over for Wentz, including his former teammate Nick Foles. We all remember Foles now. Placed an injured Wentz in the 2017 season and led the Eagles to a Super Bowl win on Acho's team. So Acho. Would trade for Nick Foles be bad for Carson Wentz? Uh, it'd be good for the Colts, so I don't care. <laughs> I don't care what it would be like for Thank Carson you. Wentz. Like, at the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Now, if you trade for anybody to fill in the void of Carson Wentz, Nick Foles would be the perfect candidate to trade for. I have played with Nick Foles when he was a backup. He was backing up Michael Vick. Mm. I played for Nick Foles when he was a starter. He was starting over Michael Vick and starting over Mark Sanchez. Same dude. Doesn't change. Nick Foles just happy to be there, wants to see everybody Did win. Did play better, though, team at least? Win. When he was a starter? Yeah. Yeah, we went crazy. Okay. He won right. nine okay. straight. We were three and five, ended up 10 and six. His jersey's in the Hall of Fame for most passing touchdowns against a team against the Raiders. He threw like seven yeah. passing touchdowns. He went crazy. It was the dumbest thing I've seen in my life. 28 touchdowns, two interceptions. Nick Foles, when he gets going, um, another conversation, but I'm going to say this. Yeah, yeah. Nick Foles at his best 
is a top five quarterback when the other when every other quarterback is at their best. Nick Foles at his best. So peak to a, peak. Peak Nick Foles Nick, is thank top you. Five. I never figured out how to simplify it. Yeah, That's yeah. it. Peak to peak. Nick Foles is a top five quarterback. That's the segment that. for a show tomorrow. I can't argue that. I'm top five in history. If peak, but <laughs> peak to peak, I'm still yeah, cut. That's only like um, five days. <laughs> but peak to peak, Nick Foles okay. is that dude. Okay. All that being said, Nick Foles isn't trying to take anybody's job. He's trying to help a team win, sure. But remember, Nick Foles led the Eagles to their first Super Bowl, and they still were like, hey, Foles, you're going to be the backup. And he was like, all right, bet. I'll just go to Jacksonville, though, for $88 million. Huh. Hey, Nick Foles, we want you in Chicago. You're going to be the backup to Mr. Trubisky. All right, bet. I'll go to back up and back him up. Nick Foles isn't trying to take a job. So I actually think Nick Foles for Indy is so good, I don't care how Wentz feels. Mm. But if I were to care how Wentz feels, it would be good for Wentz as well. Interesting. You took me some places. I'll get there after I agree with you and say, I don't care how it's going to be, Carson Wentz. Like, Carson Wentz, understand how this game goes. You have huge expectations because you have supreme talent. And you've actually exhibited a lot of that talent when healthy. The problem is we can't get into a conversation where it's about your backup. How good is your backup? Is your backup going to displace you? Who is your backup? That's not for us to have that conversation. On a football team, based on our restrictions, which is the salary cap, we're going to try and employ the best football players at every single position, right? Now, mentality comes into play, and you start talking about Nick Foles. I, I only know him from afar. I, I, religious guy. He seems mm -hmm. religified. Yeah. Respect that. Um, and, but... He's still a competitor. So he can come around here with that smile and don't let the, you know, and that, that gentleness, but don't let that fool you. Don't let the smooth taste fool you. He's trying to take your job, I hope. So if you're Carson Wentz, everybody who's playing your position is trying to take your job. But they're not all capable. This is my issue with today's culture in talking about expectations. They only talk about the burden that comes with expectations. Because I've been in positions, you've been in positions where people expect a lot of you. Yeah, there's a burden that comes from that. But there's also a comfort. And the comfort is the confidence, the fact that not only should I win, not only am I supposed to win, but damn it, I probably am going to win. If you're Carson Wentz, you have to rest in that part of expectations, which is, hey, it's a burden, but it comes with a reward. And I'm better than whoever they put out there in place of me until I get healthy. But I'll say this, though, so, because you're right. A lot of people are trying to take jobs in the NFL. Really, everybody is. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between someone trying to take your job and someone trying to keep your job. Mm -hmm. I would assume Ella's yep. daughter, when she came back before she just went off to grad school, shout out to her, Columbia. Yes, to you. Uh, I would assume that uh, when she was back home, she needed to take a car every now and then. She might take your car keys, mm. but she wasn't trying to keep your car keys. She just needed to borrow them in. <laughs> so, like, Pops, yeah, can right. I take one of the keys to the Tesla? <laughs> I'll bring it back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's trying to take the keys, but mm. she wasn't trying to keep the keys. Mm. Nick Foles, in my mind, would just be trying to take them but not keep them. Yeah. But the backup quarterbacks, albeit Jacob Eason, I think the fifth-round pick, high-level, number one overall player out of high school, he's trying to keep it. Mm. Sam Ellinger, uh, rookie, six-round pick out of Texas. He trying to keep it. Mm. But Nick Foles, yeah, he'll borrow the keys to the Colts starting quarterback job, and then he'll just give them right back. He's not trying to keep the keys. Yeah. He will take them, no gladly. Yeah, because his old ass going to have to give up the keys because he shouldn't be driving and he's too old. Here's the thing. You should because you got a good backup. I can't, I can't play with nobody like that. Oh, because your backup good. If you can't handle intra-competition, Mm -hmm. You can't deal with the opponents in intercompetition. So Carson Wentz, heal up, brother, and go get your job back. Coming up, Ben Simmons was called out by Dwight Howard on his way out the door to L.A. We'll tell you if we love or hate his comments. That's next on Speak for Yourself. And my daughter has her own testimony. Dwight Howard is on his way to the Lakers, but he did not leave Philly quietly. Howard thanked his fans on Instagram, then appeared to take a shot. Bow bow. And Ben Simmons posting, quote, and Ben, Ben Denise, which could be referenced to Simmons' free throw struggles in the playoffs. Mm. Or maybe not. Mm. So, Marcellus, mm. do you love or hate Dwight Howard taking a shot at Ben Simmons? You know what? At first, I was like, what does he mean, Ben Jones? But then I said, you know what? I love this because he's not punching down. He can't shoot free throws either. So it's like, yo, I could joke on you, especially if I'm guilty as charged of the same thing I'm clowning you for. So I love it. The reason I hate his sales because if a joke needs interpretation, it's a terrible joke. Really? And you and I have both needed to interpret this joke. I hate it. Oh, it didn't land it didn't well land. for you, huh? No land. Netflix special for you, Dwight. That's it for us. We'll see you tomorrow.